Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us here today for our webinar focused on export logistics and shipping for Cameron companies. I will be your host today. My name is Nan Zhen. I'm the export consultant with the Cameron Partnership. One of our primary purpose at, at the Cameron Partnership is to collect Cameron enterprise and companies for any industry to support information and resources they need to be successful. And in this webinars have become an important tool to make those collections within the last few months. Before we get start, I will have my co-worker, Jeremy Martel, to describe some of the functions of this platform. Jeremy, please join now. Thank you very much, Lan. Thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, for those of you who are joining one of our webinars for the first time, uh, we use the Zoom webinar um, uh, feature to uh, facilitate these learning opportunities. Um, you can use several tools that are here on the page throughout the webinar, uh, including the Q&A tool. If you'll see at the bottom of your screen, uh, it'll say Q&A with two speech bubbles. If you have any questions while our presenter is uh, presenting, please just click on that, uh, type in your question, and we will see uh, to it that we get to it toward the end of the presentation. Uh, we're going to hold all questions until the end so that we have a chance to hear out uh, our presenter, Helen, today, and uh, our other partners joining us as well. Uh, if you have have any issues or any technical difficulties or if there's something you want to let us know about, please use the chat function down below as well. Um, you'll be able to send us an email or a text or whatever it takes in order to let us know that something that you're seeing is working or you're experiencing difficulties and we'll try to help you out as well. Uh, if you have any questions, please let us know and we'll be happy to help. Uh, Lan, I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, today's webinar is focused on logistics and shipping for Cameron companies. As we know, logistics and shipping is always a challenge that we are facing here because companies' current budget have probably been reduced or affected during this economic challenge. So companies have to ensure they optimize their shipping and logistic strategy. Just to remind everybody, during the 30 to 40 minutes presentation, please use the Q&A function. As Jeremy described, drop out your questions. At the very end, we will make sure your, the panelists and guests can answer this for you. We may not get to all of the questions, but we will work to include additional information on our website after the webinar. If there are still outstanding questions, cannot be answered Im immediately. Today, we are going to hear from Helen Gwen. She's a faculty at Nova Scotia Community College. She's an instructor of business administration with a focus on international business. She has a very good insight on getting coming to the new market. She will give you a walkthrough for some practical skills when shipping up Cape Breton. We will go through what kind of shipping options and price strategy are available for you and what package and paperwork you require. And at the end, we have guests from OCOA, NSBI, and CVU who will join our Q&A section to answer all the questions related to the programming. Helen, if you are ready, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Lan. And as Lan said, um, we're going to talk today about um, doing logistics um, from Cape Breton Island and shipping. And I'm just going to get my PowerPoint up here. Um, so back in the uh, the winter, um, I put together a logistics guide, a transportation logistics guide for Cape Breton Island companies that want to ship off ship the goods and services off, off Cape Breton Island. It was mainly for companies wanting to ship internationally, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about can certainly be used for shipping to other provinces in Canada as well. And ironically, sometimes um, there's a lot of issues when you're shipping to other provinces. So we won't really have a chance to talk about that, but one of the things we're gonna give you as a takeaway at the end is a copy of the logistics guide. So what I'm going to go through today is just a a preliminary overview of the various topics. So for real good details, we encourage you to, um, to have a look through the guide. 
and hopefully we can answer your questions um, questions at the end. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today, a number of sections here, um, shipping considerations, um, developing your strategy, very important to have a strategy, um, import and export documentation, and that's one of the areas that scares people a lot is the documentation side. Uh, various transportation methods that uh, we use and can use from here from Cape Breton. Um, Inco terms, if you haven't heard that before, I'm going to go into a little more detail on that, but lots of detail in our, our document here. Um, international payment methods. Um, I teach a lot of international courses and I, the first thing I say to people is the biggest thing a company needs to worry about is getting paid. So I'm not going to get into that too much today, but um, international payment methods, very, very important. Um, your supply chain partners who can help you out with um, with uh, getting into a logistics program and getting your products to your uh, your customers. And at the very end, we'll talk about some international trade resources. And as Lan said, um, we've got some representatives here from some other uh, organizations who will be happy to answer some questions about their programming. Okay, so what are logistics and supply chain? Well, pretty simply, it's it's all about getting your products from A to B, whether that's getting your inputs or your raw materials that you need to produce your product and then actually shipping that product out to the customer. So it's all those different things that are involved in there. You know, your inbound transportation, getting your supplies, outbound transportation, um, getting your finished products to the customers. You know, do we have to store our products? Do we have to store our materials? Those things are important. Um, how do we do our order fulfillment? You know, do we do it ourselves? Do we send it somewhere else for it to be done? You know, and how do we look after our inventory? Do we actually know what's in our inventory? Um, you know, do we have enough uh, materials to produce the products that we need to? So, so that's what logistics and supply chain is all about, making sure you make all those different connections there. So this is just a nice little diagram I like that looks at the logistics components. And it's all about, you know, from the raw materials to the supplier, manufacturer, distributor, retail, and consumer. You know, there's a part of transportation. There's a part of logistics in there. There's paperwork. There's things that you have to do. They're, they all fit in that, that circle, and it just keeps continuing. So what are some of the shipping considerations that we, uh, we need to think about? So step one is selecting the carriers and forwarders. So, you know, who's going to ship your products to the, your customer? How are they going to get there? You know, you have to consider things like the best route. What are the best routes to get it there? Um, what are the best rates? One of the things that um, I talk about quite a bit in the, the document is the fact that, you know, rates are very competitive. So how do you ensure that you get the best rates? Um, you know, best clients get best rates often, but, but shopping around, doing your homework. And a lot of international business is about looking at um, doing your research. The more better prepared you are, the better chance your shipping considerations will go, will go very smoothly. Um, step two, assess your resources. Can you do this yourself? Do you have a dedicated staff member who can look after this type of process? Um, sometimes it's simply packaging up a product and bringing it to Canada Post. Other times it might be shipping a container to, uh, to a foreign country. And then, you know, depending upon what type of product you're sending, there could be all kinds of different considerations. So do you have the expertise in-house to do that? And if you don't, then you may consider hiring a third party. And we'll talk about who those third parties are. You know, step three, freight consolidation for small shipments. Um, maybe you only have a very small shipment. Maybe it needs to go to the US. Perhaps it's going to go by truck. Well, what you can do is if you make the right contacts, you can consolidate your shipment with somebody else because if you ship um, small volumes, it can be very, very expensive as compared to shipping larger volumes. So if you can pack with, in with somebody else, that makes your shipping much more um, convenient and you, you become much more competitive in your pricing. You know, import export consideration, step number four, um, duties, taxes. How do you know what's due when you're sending a product to a foreign country? Is there a tax due? 
is there a duty due? What type of paperwork do you need? Um, often you need to have help with that. Um, that. That can be a very big process, depending upon, again, what you're shipping. Then we have a section called INCO terms, which outline what the obligations of the buyer are and the obligations of the seller. And I, again, I'll talk about that in a little later. Um, partnerships, who can help you out in this process? And this is specific to shipping. And then planning your shipping itself. And one of the things that Norm uh, Hubbard of CBU, he's gonna talk to you about when I finish, is the fact that he's he teaches in the supply chain program at CBU and he's got students that can help you actually do a plan. And you know how important it is to do a, do a proper plan. Planning can save you a lot of money and a lot of headaches. So developing your shipping strategy. You know, what are the different stages that uh, you have to look at in that, that format? So I've got a number of steps here we call the export documentation process. So you first look at, uh, you know, buying your, um, your raw materials or getting a purchase order from, uh, from somebody else or somebody decides they want to buy your goods or services. Um, you have to issue a purchase order. Um, you have to prepare your order for shipping, then arrange your shipping. And, you know, each one of these has steps. And again, the, the uh, manual really goes over these very well. Um, you know, what's the shipper responsible for preparing for you? You know, maybe it's a way bill. Um, you have to think about customs. Sometimes you even have to think about Can Canadian customs before you send, uh, send products out, particularly when you're looking at the food industry. Then you look at foreign customs. Well, what do you need to have? What, what documentation do you need to have for them? And then the really important one too, as I said in a, a few minutes ago, uh, number eight, what happens when your goods are received? How do you make sure you get paid? Getting paid is very, very important. So in this export documentation process, very important to do your homework. And the Canada Border Service Agency has some great resources. And I reference them quite a bit in the booklet that you can find out some really good information. But we've, again, we've summarized this quite nicely in, uh, in the booklet. Okay, so when you're choosing a shipper, what are some of the major considerations that you have to think about? Well, you know, the first one is looking at service levels. Well, what type of services do they provide? Can they do everything that you need them to do for you? Um, when we look at pricing, um, as I mentioned, um, pricing can be very competitive in the shipping industry, and it often depends upon how much you ship, how often you ship. So pricing levels can really vary. So very, very important to, um, to have that in mind. And, you know, sometimes the shipping will be much more expensive than it costs to even produce your product. And that's, that's one of the reasons why you try to be competitive. You try to find the best option that's out there for you. Um, things like size limits, you know, how big is your product? Um, will it fit in the container? Will it fit in the envelope? Will it, you know, will it fit in the truck? Um, will it fit with other goods? There can be size limits, um, depending upon what type of product that you're, you're, you're sending out. Um, transportation time, you know, how does, how, what type of time frame do you need it to get to your customer? Does it need to be there tomorrow? Does it need to be there next week? Is it okay if it's there in two months? You know, that will determine what type of shipping that, uh, that you may choose. Um, how did you package your product? Um, I know some people that are um, in the webinar today um, are artisans. You know, if you have a piece of art that uh, is uh, breakable, you know, how do you package that product? You know, people in the food industry, you know, packaging again, very, very important. You know, whether it's to protect the food or to protect people or, you know, there, there's lots of different reasons why we, we, we have to consider packaging. And sometimes if a product is not packaged properly, then um, it can't be sent out or it gets damaged and we don't want to have that happen. Um, service quality of a shipper. You know, um, do they have a... a a service qual or quality assurance program. Um, what happens when there's a problem with your, uh, with your delivery? Are they going to cover that for you? Always make sure that you, know, you get somebody who's got lots of, consider uh, lots of experience there. You know, and then if we look at um, you know, contract uh, considerations, there's a lot of things that we have to look at in contracts. And that, that's one thing you should do. You should make sure you have a contract. 
if you're going to ship your goods out to a foreign, foreign uh, uh, company. Make sure you have a contract that can protect you. Um, there's so many things when you look at your, your, your contracts, um, and, and we're talking more contracts for shippers in this particular one, you know, risk transfer. When does the risk transfer between, you know, the shipper and, and the receiver, for instance? Um, is there subcontracting done? You might have thought you were contracting this one company and then they contracted to somebody else and then something happens. Um, make sure you're aware of that. Um, what types of transportation routes are the companies using? Um, what types of goods are they selling? Um, sending. Do they have the type of equipment that will easily get your product on and off um, transportation methods? That's actually very important. Um, do you, are you shipping dangerous goods? Um, do the goods need to be inspected? Um, are there any regulations around your goods? There, there's a lot in contracts. Again, I've explained these very, very well in, um, in the booklet. So I'm just going to give you a little highlight there of what that was. Um, insurance and liability considerations. Um, as we know, when you're shipping products, you should always have insurance. You know, insurance against theft or breakage or loss. You know, and who's responsible for those things? Um, very, very important that you uh, make sure you get your, your insurance. Um, and then the technology options. Um, what type of technology does your shipper have? Can they work with you and your technology that you have at your, 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 your plant, say? And they know when they have to come pick up products. They know how much inventory is there. Um, they know when the shipping happens. You can trace your shipping. Oh, there's so many things available these days with technology that we've, we've never had before. The next part, the one that I say a lot of people get stressed out over is the import and export actual documentation itself. And I'm not going to explain these fully today, but I'm just going to tell you some of the different things that you potentially may need. You know, I, when I teach classes on this, I normally say, you know, there's probably at least four or five documents that you need. Sometimes you need 15 documents. Um, it depends upon your shipment. That's why it's often good to hire a third party, someone who knows how to fill out all the documentation. If you're not an expert in it, you should get somebody who is. So what are some of the, according to the Canada Border Services Agency, what are some of the documents that we should be looking at? A commercial invoice. So we all know what an invoice is. Um, a consular invoice. Perhaps a bill of lading. That, that's that's a piece of documentation that looks at the type, the quantity, and the destination of, of your product. Packing list, what's actually in your, uh, in your container or in your, your, um, your package. Um, certificate of origin, you know, where did this uh, product come from? Is it a product of Canada? And there's lots of rules and regulations around certificate of origin. Again, I, I talk about that in more detail. And this can have a big implication on, you know, how much uh, duties or taxes you might have to pay on a particular product. You know, in here I mentioned about um, the different free trade agreements that are existing out there. So if, we, uh, if we're shipping goods to the U.S. or Mexico, it might fall under the U.S. MCA uh, trade agreement. If we're shipping goods to Europe, it might fall under the CETA agreement. So again, certificate of origin has to be with every, every type of uh, product that goes out. Um, maybe there's export or import permits. Um, again, depends upon what you're, what you're shipping. Um, do you require Revenue Canada documents? You may or may not require these. Um, maybe there's a cargo control document. And other things such as insurance. So there, that's just a few of the the types of documents that you may require. So next we'll talk about um, the different transportation methods. So again, these are very detailed with actual um, contacts um, and um, good lists of, of potential contacts and how to, how to um, websites and all that kind of thing. So I'm not gonna have all that in my, my information today. I'm just gonna go through the major, uh, major types of methods. So first one is air freight. So un unfortunately we don't do a whole lot of air freight out of Sydney. 
So I'm using Halifax here. And if anybody's ever shipped by air before, you know it tends to be the most costly um, type of uh, shipment method. But of course, it might be the most costly, but it might be your only alternative. You know, if you're shipping seafood to Asia or Europe, um, you need to use air freight because the product has to get there quickly. Or if you have uh, very quick uh, delivery um, expectations of your of yourself, and you'll deliver your product in a couple of days, you often will have to have to look at air freight. So, as I say, there's a complete list of all the different air freight companies that are, are operating out of the uh, the Halifax Stanfield Airport. And so, you know, you could be sending it through all kinds of other airports, but I'm I'm just giving you the more um, local, so local. Sydney, Cape Breton area, and then also looking at, um, at Halifax. So one of the things I did include under the, uh, the air freight section was freight forwarders and customs brokers. So your freight forwarder is the person who actually moves your product from A to B. So whether that's your, your trucking company or your airline company or your um, ocean freight company, that's the people who physically move your products. And your customs brokers are the people that look after the paperwork, specifically the paperwork related to customs as well, but they do a lot more paperwork than that. And freight forwarders can also be customs brokers. So if you notice here on the list, I have uh, freight forwarders on one side and those that are also customs brokers, I've, I've ticked off. And again, just refer to your booklet and you'll, you'll see a lot more information on who's doing what. So you've got lots of choices. And these are the people that we call your third party delivery people. Um, they're on that, this list. So what are the key considerations in air, air transportation? Again, your documentation, the size of your shipping containers. Again, you're limited with, um, with air freight. Obviously, um, you know, it's not the same as just putting a container on a ship. Um, you have to fit certain specifications. So again, if you look at our, our documentation, um, you can go in and look at the various websites and, and see what, what people's requirements are. What types of products are you actually shipping? Well, that's a really big uh, consideration when you're looking at, um, at air freight there. Um, some of the types of, um, Products could be anything from perishables to valuables. And I'm just giving you the list that, uh, that we, we have in the booklet here. Unusual shape and size products, um, live animals, um, human remains actually is listed. Um, consignments requiring special care, dangerous goods. There's a lot of different types of products that, um, that, that uh, have considerations that, you know, may make the difference in you deciding whether or not to use air. You know, security. We all know going to an airport, security clearance is very, very important. And uh, that's no different with your goods as well as people. Um, you know, customs. You know, have you prepared all the proper paperwork? And have you met all the rules and regulations that are necessary for customs? Um, then we have things like, you know, aircraft chartering. Do you want to charter your own airplane? Or do you want a courier? Use a courier or air freight with uh, one of the, the big uh, transportation companies. Mm -hmm. You've got lots of choices in air transport, and it usually will go back to what your particular needs are. And that's one of the things we want you to think about today is, you know, what are your needs? You know, and some of the things I'm talking about, air freight, um, Ocean freight may not be what you need at all. Maybe you just need Canada Post, and we're going to talk about them uh, just a little bit later. Again, that whole packing thing again, very, very important. You know, how you pack your products, um, whether it's, it's, it's a size thing or whether it's a breakage thing. There, there's a lot of different considerations that you have to look at when you're, you're looking at packing and, and handling and, and who's, who's touching your product. And... The, the role of the International Air Transportation Association, you know, they do all the guidelines um, that are set forth for rules and regulations for the uh, transportation of goods. So I, I reference them in the document. So next we're gonna move on to ocean freight. And ocean freight tends to be significantly cheaper than air freight. 
Um, but obviously the trade-off on that one is it takes a long, much longer time for your products to get uh, around the world. You know, you can probably get to Europe in 10, 12 days, but you know, to get to Asia, you're probably looking at, you know, 40, 50 days, unless you transport your product across Canada and then it can go from, you know, Vancouver to, to, uh, to Asia in say, you know, 10 days. So there's, there's lots of options there. So we don't do uh, ocean freight out of, um, out of the port of Sydney, um, not at this point in time. So we're gonna look at the port of Halifax. Now, here's one big consideration too. I'm not talking about trucking yet, but I will be the next one. So if you're going to do ocean freight and you have a container yourself or you're getting a container to ship, um, it costs somewhere in the vicinity of $1,600 to $1,800 just to get a container shipped down from Halifax for you to pack it and get it shipped back to Halifax. So even though ocean freight may be fairly inexpensive, um, we're at a little disadvantage in Cape Breton when it comes to, comes to uh, the fact what we have to pay for containers. So it's just some, one, one of the considerations that you have to think about. Okay, so the Port of Halifax, as you can see from this list, has quite a number of um, different major lines that, uh, that go through the Port of Halifax. Um, most of these lines work on a weekly basis, although some work um, every 12 to 15 days. So there's a lot more logistics and preparation when you're looking at, at ocean freight, at least in terms of timing. You know, you have to make sure that you've got your timing right in terms of when uh, when products going out because more than likely it's not more than uh, than once a week and then you have to look at how long does it take to get to your customer as well so same thing as with uh, air transport you have to think about your documentation um, you have to think about your containers are they full containers or less than full uh, container loads and at the very beginning, I talked a little bit about freight consolidation. So maybe you wanna ship your products with somebody else. So again, you'll need somebody to set that up for you. It'll cost you a lot less money to ship your products um, with somebody else, um, unless you're taking a full container load yourself. Um, there's a lot of different types of containers out there. Um, if you notice on the right-hand side, um, typical container is a 20 foot or 40 foot container and they can only handle so much product. Um, there's different costs involved in, in these types of containers. Now, um, the next part, you know, the um, bulk cargo, that would be loose, loose product, break bulk, containerized, roll on, roll off, all those kinds of things. They're, they're looking at um, what types of containers you're using and how easy is it to get it on the ship, get it off the ship, uh, again, I'm not going to get into any details here, but you can look that up in the document. Um, one of the things I wanted to quickly touch on was load limits. Um, if you look at a container, say you're, you're shipping daffodils, you're shipping flowers. So if you're shipping flowers, they're a very light product. So you can fill that container right out to the door, right to the top if you're doing flowers. But if you're selling a very heavy product like a piece of machinery or say hardwood floors as an example, you can only fill it to the, the, uh, the weight limit that uh, that, uh, that particular product uh, container has. So that, that's an issue. Um, dangerous goods, uh, I've mentioned that a few times. Um, dangerous goods have a whole list of rules and regulations that go around them. So, so you, have to, uh, you have to consider that. So probably the most popular transportation system, we certainly see here in, in North America anyway, and across Canada is uh, road transportation. So our trucking companies. So I, I haven't listed um, any trucking companies in this quick presentation, um, but I have in the document, I've listed all the different uh, local transportation companies and considerations. And uh, so there's a really nice little section there on road transportation. But what I want to bring your attention to is, you know, things like the Canada-US border. Um, there's a lot of um, a lot of rules and regulations when you're shipping goods across the border. 
And again, we've got the free trade agreement with the US, which helps us with a lot of things. But, but anyway, we have to uh, make sure that we, are, we totally understand the Canada-US border issues that, that could happen for us. And, you know, your goods could be refused uh, entry into the U.S., for instance, you know, um, your driver, you know, does your driver have a, a, a Nexus car? You know, is it the first time they're going through? Like, there, there's a lot of different um, considerations that you have to think about when you're, when you're going across uh, international borders. And, you know, which border crossing do you pick? And if you know yourself, if you go into the U.S., you know some border crossings ask you a whole lot less questions than other ones do. Um, so it, it's it's picking the, the the right one. Usually from um, Nova Scotia here, we usually pick uh, Callis or um, or Holton tend to be the two border crossings that uh, that we look at. Again, your documentation. You know what type of documentation do you need? Um, what's the size of the truck that's um, that's shipping your documents out. And even though there's pretty standard truck sizes, there can be some variations in, in the sizing. So something you need to know. Um, you know, does the container need to be plugged in? Is it refrigerated or is it not refrigerated? You know, again, it depends upon what kind of product you're trying to sell. Do you have then uh, less than a truck load or a full truck load? Again, that consolidation service, again, very, very important. Um, a lot of products get consolidated, for instance, in, uh, in Moncton, because that tends to be a very central location. And of course, we have border security issues. You know, um, do we have to have certain types of certifications in order to get across the border? Do our trucking companies have to have certifications to get across the border? Those are important things for us to know. But I put here the note on the bottom. No matter what transportation method you use, trucking will likely be part of your logistics process. So if you think about um, transporting goods, and I know I've, uh, I've transported different things around the world, and you'd be shocked at sometimes companies don't make an allowance for the truck to pick up the goods from the Porsche or from the Air Porsche. Um, you know, how did it get there to begin with? Probably by truck transportation. So most types of products when they're shipped out have a couple of different methods of transportation that uh, that are used. So then we have mail and Canada Post. Okay, most popular and cheapest for smaller companies. So some of the key considerations that you have to think about here are, you know, restricted items. There's lots of lists of restricted items, things you're not allowed to, um, to send through the, the postal service. Um, looking at your costs. Again, uh, even um, shipping through Canada Post can be expensive from time to time if you've ever sent something that's really heavy. You know, maybe you need to look at another alternative there. Um, they charge fuel surcharges, just like a lot of other companies. Well, that's not an issue at the moment, but if the cost of fuel goes up, that could be an issue. Um, they are, they're still subject to the same documentation that um, a, lot of, a lot of types of transportation methods are. Um, maybe there's different export uh, permits that are required. And again, I've got a really good section in the, the booklet on Canada Post because it is very popular for a lot of small companies um, like to use that type of method. And, you know, on the bottom here, this is a really important thing that I, I know a lot of really small companies like to send products as, and I'll use the quotations, gifts. That is actually not legal in most countries. So you shouldn't be doing that. On, and one of the things about logistics is that you can actually um, get barred from sending your products to foreign countries. So you need to be careful with that particular one. Then we have courier services. So we have pretty good service. It's going to really improve with FedEx. Um, FedEx and UPS offer some great courier services um, here in, in Cape Breton. And they typically use air and truck transport. As well, they're subject to the same paperwork and documents and customs as, as everybody else is. Um, but again, they can help you. They can simplify the process for you. And you know, they can do very fast delivery or you, you know, if you're doing ground transport, 
um, that that can take a lot longer. But but you've got a lot of alternatives here, and that's what we're trying to tell you with uh, with this booklet. No, depending upon you know what kind of product that you're you're trying to sell. Okay, so next section is on Inco terms, and I know I'm getting using my time up here, so I'm going to be a little faster. So Inco terms 2020. So what Inco terms are is they set out the obligations of your buyers and your sellers. So if I'll just give you a quick example here. So if you look at the top of the chart, it says Exec Works, and if you notice down the bottom, Exec Works the orange is the buyer's obligation so if you choose an inco term so that says exactly what the buyer is responsible for and exactly what the seller is responsible for so in this particular one basically the buyer picks up the product at the seller's plant and is responsible for all all the um the transportation related costs if you look at the bottom ddp and that's one where you're perhaps selling a product that is um, uh, breakable. I'll just use it as an example. And you want to make sure that it gets to your customer um, in the, the state it's supposed to be in. So you maybe want to control all the different transportation aspects. So if you want to do that and control everything and have that be your obligation, it's going to be DDP. Um, so there, there's your two extremes, and I explain every term very well in the booklet. Um, one common one that a lot of people use is CIF, which is in the middle here, and that's your cost of insurance and freight. So important to have your, your INCO term on your documents. And section F, we're getting to the end here, international methods of payment. So there's, there's typically four different payment types. So there's payment in advance. Think about uh, when you buy anything online, you don't, it doesn't get shipped until you pay for it in advance, often using, a, well, most times using a credit card. So when you're shipping um, a lot of products, payment in advance would be lovely to have, but that's not normally the, uh, the way that many companies deal with, uh, with payments. They often deal with what's called open account. And that means you get paid under your contract agreement in say 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever it is. It's probably the most popular payment method. But what it does is means you have to have a lot of faith that your buyer is actually going to pay you. And I'll talk about that in another minute. Then you have what's called documentary collections. So you get paid at certain points. So maybe your buyer pays you 25% when your product is produced, pays you 25% when it's shipped, 25% when it's received and 25% 30 days later. You know, it, it depends upon whatever's in your documents. And then a, a popular form, although it's sometimes getting less popular, is a letter of credit, which outlines conditional payments and it's organized through your bank. And your bank and the buyer's bank and you and your buyer, you're all in a little square there and everybody has the responsibility within letter of credit. You know, they can cost you a few dollars to get your letter of credit, but, but again, it's, it's quite a secure method of, um, of payment, ensuring payment. And then of course, to ensure payment, um, I always like to bring up EDC, Export Development Canada. They have accounts receivable insurance, which will cover you up to 90% of the cost of your um, your product, well, your your purchase order, um, for instance, they'll cover up to ninety percent of that, and usually they charge you, you know, it's over one percent. So that's a really good way to ensure you get paid. But that has nothing to do with if there's any damage to your shipments. You need to have insurance for um, transportation type damage. And almost lastly here, your supply chain partners. So who are your supply chain partners? Or what I like to call the third party logistics uh, people, um, could be your freight forwarders, those people who transport your goods, your customs brokers, people who look after your paperwork, you know, the different types of carriers involved in that process. And maybe your banking and financial services. You know, particularly if you're doing large transactions, it, it's often good to, you know, be working with your banks to make sure that you have the money available um, 
and that you're going to be able to, uh, to pay your obligations there. So there's some of your supply chain partners. Again, more detail in the, uh, in the booklet. And lastly, section H um, in your booklet, which is our international trade resources. So um, in the, the end of the booklet, there's a list of a number of different organizations or resources um, locally and regional contacts that can help you out with more so with exporting as opposed to just shipping itself. Because what we're trying to do by doing these types of webinars is to get more people interested in doing international business and, and trying to help you, you know, um, understand the different pain points that happen from time to time. And shipping can be one of those pain points. But um, at the end of the document, we've got lots of resources there of uh, different organizations that can help you depending upon what sector you're in. So I'm finished with, uh, with my section, just giving you a big overview of kind of uh, what's, what's available out there in shipping. And I'm gonna hand it over to Norm from CBU. And Norm's gonna tell you a little bit about his program in the supply chain program and what it can do, potentially do for you. And then we'll have some other representatives. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, as uh, Helen mentioned, uh, and thank you, Helen, um, I teach at uh, CBU. I teach the uh, post baccalaureate uh, students at CBU. Uh, that means that they're working on their second uh, second uh, degree or diploma in this case. Uh, teach uh, both the business management students and the supply chain management students. And what we do is uh, in uh, I teach the capstone project. It's called. And what that is is we partner with uh, businesses and organizations, both. Uh, nonprofit and uh, and for-profit organizations and uh, we try to solve world uh, real world problems and so the uh, the students as a team uh, work with them and uh, they have access to uh, the professors at uh, CBU and some other experts in the field and uh, and we do address those uh, real problems so uh, in discussion with uh, with Helen and Land and, and some of the others uh, 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 we saw this as a real potential for uh, for uh, businesses in Cape Breton to utilize some of those resources and be able to export more or be able to uh, create a plan for export or uh, uh, look at things like uh, how do we market overseas and uh, my uh, my students would uh, uh, take those real life problems and try to uh, solve those um, for the organization. So it's a way of utilizing uh, uh, some free labor in, in a way, but uh, uh, it's a way to solve a real problem and give the students a great opportunity to learn. So if, if there's any questions about that, I am available. Um, my contact information will be put up by, uh, um, by uh, Jeremy at the end there. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks again, Norm. And thanks, Helen. That's very insightful and lots of great information there. And now um, we are going to take a look at the question for, from our attending today. So maybe I will start off by uh, asking you a question I have here. So Helen, you talk so many hands-on skills today. Within this short time, there's a lots of information we have to digest after this presentation. So are there any other like resources or training you can re recommend to the audience for them to improve, improve their skills on shipping and logistics? Yes, Lynn, actually there's, um, there's a global um, value chain course that the Forum for International Trade Training puts on and actually um, those are funded uh, in Nova Scotia by ACOA and they're actually put on by NSBI. I think I put every acronym in here, but, um, but those are very, uh, very good programs to, uh, to learn about uh, things like global value chain. And it only costs participants, and Wanda, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's still, it costs like $57 
and it's usually a, a two-day program and I actually teach that for um, for fit and we go through all the various aspects of um, of global supply chain from ordering your products to selling your products to customers to disposing of products in in um, in foreign in uh, in foreign countries so that's um that's a big uh that's a big course which is which is great and um i don't have it scheduled at the moment but we could have one potentially in the fall or early in the uh, in the new year but again so i noticed some questions here on COVID, and uh COVID is affecting some of the courses that we've been uh, we've been putting on thanks hannah that's very great information sir and just remind everyone, please keep dropping your uh, questions in the Q&A boxes there. So I saw there's one um, question in that box right now. What kind of challenge can we expect when exporting while we deal with COVID-19 restrictions? So who, who want to take the chance to answer this question? Do you, do you want me to uh, take a shot at that, uh, Helen, first? Yeah, I, I think you're the better one for that one, uh, Nora. Well, I'll, I'll just give you the, the perspective of, of what uh, what we're seeing right now. Um, we're seeing actually that uh, uh, a lot of logistics organizations are actually becoming stronger through COVID. Um, so you look at uh, things like uh, FedEx, um, uh, UPS, and uh, uh, some of the other courier companies, uh, they're becoming a lot, a lot more efficient, and uh, part of that is because of the increase in volume. So as the volume increases, their uh, their transportation lanes and their uh, uh, courier system um, gets a critical mass, so that they can um, uh, deliver things a lot more quickly. So it's it's actually a positive from that aspect. Uh, from uh, the aspect of uh, um, getting resources that you can meet with one-on-one -on -one or in person obviously that's been a challenge as all of uh, uh, social distancing and, and things like that so uh, it's been difficult for uh, people trying to get into the uh, COVID industry uh, into transportation so so some uh, uh, some of the former students who are trying to find jobs it's harder right now because uh, because of those restrictions but uh, um, it's transitioned a lot of things from uh, um, to a lot more home delivery. And uh, that's been a, a real positive for overall for the, uh, uh, for the logistics field and, and also for, uh, for rates in the future. Thanks, Norman. May I add to that, ma'am? Sure. I would just like to add to it with respect to the international context and, and what that could mean based on what country you're going into. And I'll just give an example uh, of that with respect to Japan and, and how COVID has affected Japan with respect to the trust. And in particular, when it comes to e-commerce and home delivery and, and um, you know, the changes that have taken place there, in, in that market, they usually had to be home to be able to accept and get someone to sign for the package. And that's changing now. So now uh, they're implementing drop boxes where people can go in and pick up their product after hours or they're also um, also looking at methods of, of rescheduling shipments for when the individual is actually going to leave home. So there's new technologies that are coming out now that uh, a, a person who orders something can go online and make changes to when their shipping their shipment arrives at their destination. The other thing that COVID has done on the positive side is it's made it very favorable for us from Canada in the perspective of the fact that it takes a, a while to get a product to Japan. And a, a, a Japanese person won't accept the product shipped from Canada if it arrives the next day because of the potential of getting COVID from that. So there's a whole bunch of things that you have to take into consideration. And, and a lot of it will come down to what market you're going into. And the other thing I'd like to add is, of course, because of COVID and the shutdown of many airlines into many countries, that has increased the cost dramatically for companies um, but we're hoping that will return to normal when we get things back to normal. So while th some things have increased in cost, some things have been made more efficient, as Norman uh, mentioned. So uh, again, it depends on where you're going and what you're doing in the world. Thanks, Adarni.
Hey, Lynn, I, I see another question. I see a question by Paul. Um, okay. Paul, yeah. sure. So Paul says, if I'm, if I'm exporting between provinces, should I actually have an export plan or a staff member, if available, if I wish to plan to export internationally, or should I just hire a consultant? I mean, that really depends. And, and, and actually, Paul's one of our service providers, too, I, I should mention. Uh, he's a great resource to help you out with all the, uh, the resources that are available out there in exporting. Um, but <laughs> that one's a, t a tough one. If Do you have the people to do these, these types of activities? That's the one thing you have to think about. But honestly, I, you know, I think a lot of people should at least have a, a discussion with a, a consultant, in, a transportation consultant. Um, when they're looking at shipping the goods because they could have a lot of different resources that you're not a you're not aware of and You know, maybe you initially hire them to do your your shipping for you and then you learn how to do it yourself There's a couple of different options that are available there. So it's all in how comfortable you are with this, but um, You know there, a lot of us out there have some great education programs for people. Um, so you don't always have to hire a third party, but sometimes it's better to hire a third party. It just depends upon your, your comfortability with, uh, with these things. Thanks, Helen. So while we are waiting for more questions to come in, so we have to show the evaluation survey on your screen that Jeremy is going to launch. Please fill it out that uh, as it will help us inform us upcoming topics and format. Okay, great. So there's another question for Wanda. Can you tell us about some of the Europe market development program? Sure, no problem. Um, so this is a, a something relatively new program, obviously just launched last week um, with regards to getting uh, some uh, in-market uh, support and advice, guidance, uh, companies wishing to look at Europe as uh, as either a, a new opportunity for them or for um, expanding their presence there. And so basically it allows the company to make an application through NSBI um, and we work with you on that process. And then at that point, if it's approved, um, there is a, a monetary cost to it on the client's behalf uh, as well, around uh, $4,750. Um, but what that provides the client with is, um, is an in-market consultant uh, and someone working on their behalf on their market of choice. And, and obviously, you know, someone with uh, expertise, not only with market intelligence, but with what their product or service that they're offering. But certainly, if there's someone has specific questions about it and would like to chat, uh, they can reach out to me directly and we can go through that with them. Thanks, Wanda. So, so we've actually had a few uh, people reach out and ask if um, they would be able to get a copy of this presentation. Uh, you absolutely will. So in the next few days, you will receive a copy of this presentation as well as the guide um, that Helen has uh, referenced. So rest assured, uh, we don't expect you to remember this all by memory. <laughs> so Norm, would you like to answer that one, Norm? Sure. I, I was just going to, so it's, uh, the question is about uh, uh, the lobster industry and uh, what are some uh, insights about what's happening. The uh, lobster industry, uh, unfortunately, has a very limited time window uh, for sales and uh, uh, export. And uh, as such, the uh, uh, it, it's almost one of those things where, you know, hopefully next year it will come back. So uh, there isn't, from my understanding, there isn't uh, immediate plans about how to improve the situation. It's more about uh, trying to weather this storm and then uh, um, try to have a better season next year. 
Thanks, Norman. There's another one here. What are the tax concerns when shipping products international? How do I make sure to collect and report the, the right things? So who, who would like to answer this one? I'll answer that one, Lynn. Okay. Um, honestly, that it depends upon where you're going. Um, it's different in, in every single country. It depends upon what type of product you're selling. So that's what I mentioned at the very beginning. It's really important that you do your research. So if you look at, um, I want to sell X product to this country and you're gonna do your research on your duties and taxes in that particular country. Now, to go back to the third party logistics again, that, you know, that company can help you identify that as well. That's one of their expertise um, when, you, when you're looking at, uh, at going internationally. But if you wanna do it yourself, um, there is what's called a tariff finder. The federal government has a tariff finder. I believe I have, a, I have a, a link to that in the booklet. So you can find out what taxes and duties may be uh, applicable to your particular product. So you want it, you're right. You want to make sure you do it right. You don't want to get stopped at the border. Can I jump in on that as well, Lynn? Yes. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to the tariffs and taxes, you know, again, as Helen said, it depends on the market that you're going into. However, those markets that we have uh, free trade agreements, you, we have preferential treatment in, in uh, those markets with respect to tariffs. And, and, you know, with those, we've had a lot of reduction in tariff rates, uh, depending on the product, again, that's being shipped. Um, so what you need to do is, is go into the tariff finder, enter in your product, your, your, your number of your, your product, and uh, source out what country you're going into to determine what kind of tariff rate you, you can, uh, you'll have to pay. Now, in some countries, for example, with the uh, comprehensive cassette, um, the CETA agreement, for example, seafood has been reduced by 90, 95% to 99% uh, in tariffs. So again, it's going to depend as well if you're manufacturing uh, uh, something into a market that you're sending into a market that has inputs from another market, that will determine what your tax rate will be as, as well. So for an example for that, and I'm just going to pull it out of the air, is say, for example, going down to the United States, that your product would have to have 50% either U.S. or Canadian inputs. If it has more than 50% uh, inputs from China, for example, you're not going to get the preferential treatment under the, and again, I'm just using those percentages as, as an example, not as the real percentages, but it depends on what market you're going into will determine. With respect to the Netherlands, you should be aware that the uh, Netherlands has a, a deferral on taxes, um, should you ship into them. Uh, so that's something that you can look into that uh, for the Netherlands and, and as the Netherlands is, is key to the Benelux areas and the shipment throughout Europe, that might be a choice for you to do uh, so that you don't have to pay taxes until after your product is actually uh, sold to the final customer. Thanks, Darnie. So we have a question uh, that's come into the chat um, yeah. and it uh, brings us back to uh, the current uh, uh, situation going on uh, with COVID-19. Um, so the question here is, could you speak to some of the challenges posed by um, uh, certain restrictions that are present under COVID-19? For instance, uh, minimums on PPE shipments out of China and uh, recently last week in seafood or also to other recent outbreaks uh, in uh, other countries such as um, uh, in China and the effects that that's had on, on products. Um, and then there's follow-up of what would your advice be to people with supply chain or buyers in China? <laughs> very specific, <laughs> very good question. I'm sure not yeah. the only person who's wondered. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll try to take that one a little bit. Um, uh, every country has the right to limit the amount of uh, product that's shipped in or out of the, the country. So with COVID, we've seen things uh, become more protectionist with respect to countries. Um, that will open up again. But what I would do is suggest that if you're specifically looking at China, is reach out to the trade commissioner that's relevant in that region. Um, so there's a number of trade commissioners throughout uh, 
China in trade in either the embassy or the consulates around around China, depending on what region you're going into, and look for the uh, trade commissioner in your sector. Uh, all that information is available online, and that's the best place to start. I think uh, when you're looking at that, to, if you have some uh, questions, immediate questions that need to be answered with respect to the COVID. Yeah, and just just uh, further to that. Uh, um, it would be really hard to be an expert on on this topic uh, or any of these topics because things are changing daily. Uh, so we look at some of the examples of uh, uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, his news conference, uh, there's a new program daily. So uh, um, you really have to do kind of constant research to see what's the latest update on these things. So uh, uh, Darlene's uh, recommendation is, is bang on. You reach out to some of the experts in their industry because they'll know exactly what's going on in that area. Yeah, I would strongly recommend, uh, you know, reaching out to your trade commissioners. That's something that we will often recommend or, or connect you with them ourselves if we can help in that way. There's another question there in what, what is the next big things in supply chain? Uh, the, the three that I would mention is uh, uh, 3D printing um, is uh, uh, kind of a big thing going on in supply chain right now and, and the ability to uh, make individualized orders that way. Um, artificial intelligence, of course, is uh, uh, really improving uh, uh, lane deliveries and, and uh, uh, what's going on that way. And then, of course, just the, the transition to uh, uh, more internet buying um, uh, versus uh, uh, retail stores. And uh, um, that's greatly impacted as well. Our supply chain, of course, and, and uh, um, also consumer behavior, right? Yes. I'd also like to add that traceability is a big one. Uh, so being able to track your product right to, back to the source from right, if we take seafood for example, right from the ocean to the plate. So being able to provide that information to the customer on demand is going to be a big thing in the future. Thanks, Darlene. It seems like there's no questions in the Q&S box here. And I think it's it, we have already over that little bit of time here. I'm, I think I'm going to get, get into a wrap up. Thanks everyone for joining us and for the great questions here. Especially thanks to today's panelists and guests, Helen, Norm, Darling, and Wanda. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, you're able to rewatch this webinar when we load this presentation on our website. In addition, we will share this dig digital copy of Cambridge and Transportation Guide to you after this webinar as well. Please watch your email. Um, for future sessions are currently being developed and planned for later this month, so please continue to watch our, uh, the details on our website and uh, social media. Jeremy, is there any other additional comments on technique side there? No, not at all. I think everything went quite well. The screen only went dark for one person, so I call that a win today. Thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate everyone coming out, and I especially appreciate everyone with the great answers and presentation. No, oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks everyone, for joining. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Have a great day.